Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode 259 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, I'm going to share some interesting research with you about crucial nutrient deficiencies that are commonly found in those with psoriasis. This is a big deal because what's in your diet and what your body can actually digest and absorb are crucial to good health. Your body generally doesn't make nutrients it needs to thrive, which is why you need to consume them in appropriate amounts. And this may vary from person to person based on a variety of factors, including genetics, stress levels, medication depletions, infections, etc. And while eating nutrients from your food-based sources is ideal, it may not be enough depending on your individual need, current nutrient stores, and your gut's ability to extract and absorb those nutrients from food. Another factor I should mention is the well-established connection between psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis with inflammatory processes and other inflammatory conditions such as liver disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, inflammatory bowel disease, and more. I've discussed many of these topics on the Healthy Skin Show and we'll put links to these episodes in the show notes for you. This is why an ample supply of nutrients for your body to use to do so many things is crucial because it's under even more stress with everything it's facing. As a clinical nutritionist, I often discover that most of my psoriatic clients struggle to know what to eat due to so many iterations of elimination diets that also won't cause a flare. About 75% of the time, my psoriasis clients also struggle with chronic gut issues as well, which have been normalized by their doctor as just IBS. And that said, it's not necessary to have IBS symptoms like gas, bloating, constipation, heartburn, or diarrhea to have a hidden problem residing within the GI tract. This is a huge misconception that leads people to think that their gut is fine because they poop like a champ one to three times a day and eat a nutritious diet. Take it from me. There is no way you can know that your nutrient stores and nutrient intake are appropriate for you without, in many instances, looking at labs. And I'll talk more on this later. So let's talk about the current research demonstrating that the following nutrients appear to be suboptimal or even deficient in those with psoriasis. And this list includes omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, vitamin B12, fiber, and especially the fermentable kind, also known as FODMAPs, selenium, and protein. To kick things off, the connection of omega-3 fatty acids to psoriasis should really be rather straightforward, since we know that omega-3s help with inflammation, and you must remember that psoriasis has a huge inflammation component. The inflammation produced in psoriasis results in a variety of elevated cytokines, which can trigger all sorts of symptoms. And this is why biologic drugs work, by the way, because they block them. Omega-3 fatty acids may support blocking the Th17 response, as well as reducing cytokines associated with psoriasis, including IL-17, IL-23, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Omega-3s can be found in a variety of foods, including wild-caught cold water fish like salmon and cod, ground flax seeds, cold-pressed flax oil, raw walnuts, chia seeds, oysters, and also I'm going to add to this grass-fed and finished beef, which I have found to be a healthy option eaten maybe once to twice a week for a number of my psoriasis clients as they get things under control. And then also certain algae. And I just add this to the list because this is what vegan omega-3 supplements are derived from. This all said, don't go into increasing your omega-3 intake hoping that this will be the thing to make your psoriasis disappear. It's certainly a factor often in a much bigger picture of dysfunction under the surface. So when researchers have looked at the impact of omega-3 supplementation on those with psoriasis, they didn't find any impact at all and concluded that it's not worth doing. 
However, as a clinical nutritionist, looking at the bigger picture of what's going on in your psoriasis case from several different perspectives, we often need to combine several interventions together to make an impact that individually those steps might not get you results. So that might be why when omega-3 supplementation is combined with other interventions, we actually get better results rather than when it's just done on its own. So I just wanted to give you that perspective here. Now, moving along to vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency is fairly common in many chronic skin issues, including psoriasis. It's something we assess all clients for in my clinical practice and hope to see their vitamin D level in a more optimal range, somewhere between 60 to 80. This optimal range is considered higher than what's often accepted as normal, which is anything over 30. Vitamin D is important because it modulates the immune response and has been shown to reduce keratinocyte proliferation and can lower certain inflammatory cytokines associated with psoriasis, including tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now, some researchers have looked at what I'd consider a very high megadose of vitamin D, ranging from 30,000 to 60,000 IUs daily for a limited period of time. And this did appear to show helpful results. Before giving this a try on your own, I'd recommend working with a practitioner who is extremely knowledgeable in high mega doses of nutrients and who can review appropriate labs so your levels can be monitored to avoid possible side effects. And this goes well beyond just vitamin D, by the way, because vitamin D impacts other things in the body. Again, this is not something I'd recommend trying on your own, but it is certainly something you could bring to your practitioner and discuss with them. I obviously need to mention that although sun exposure can trigger the endogenous production of vitamin D in the skin, dietary sources of vitamin D are just as important because many people limit sun exposure. And sometimes this just happens purely because many of us work inside for a long portion of the day and miss that key sun exposure time. And there's also a lot of individuals, myself included, where we live in areas where the sun intensity drops for about half of the year to a point where sun exposure cannot appropriately trigger vitamin D production. So we want to look for those dietary sources, which include cod liver oil, swordfish, salmon, tuna, sardines, beef liver, egg, or cheese, and vitamin D supplements, just so you're aware, are an option and are typically derived from either cod liver oil, lanolin derived from wool, or lichen, which is the vegan source of vitamin D. I've also shared on the Healthy Skin Show the benefits of considering a topical vitamin D cream and how that could be helpful for psoriasis. Just be aware that this will impact your body stores and should be monitored just as you would oral supplementation of vitamin D. Another commonly low nutrient that I see in my practice is vitamin B12, which often is due to a hidden H. pylori infection. That said, B12 is important for several reasons, including energy production, protection of the myelin sheath found in your nerves, and is helpful against oxidative stress. It's also a crucial nutrient along with folate and vitamin B6 in reducing homocysteine, which is considered by conventional medicine to be a marker for cardiovascular risk. As a clinical nutritionist who often sees insufficient nutrient stores in clients, vitamin B12 levels should be significantly higher than what is deemed acceptable by conventional standards. I've had many clients experiencing significant vitamin B12 deficiency symptoms despite their level hovering in the 300s, which is considered normal. Typically, I prefer a client's B12 to be around 800 for optimal health. That said, B12 must be balanced with folate. So before you start supplementation, please get folate checked as well in a lab since these nutrients go hand in hand in producing healthy red blood cells. Now, healthy food sources are typically limited to animal products, including meat, liver, eggs, milk, and seafood, as well as the vegan option, nutritional yeast. And though I've talked about topical vitamin B12 for 
eczema, there is research published in a 2017 paper demonstrating that it may also be incredibly helpful for psoriasis. And so in moving along, it is important for me to share the diet is commonly something that does require tweaking to some degree, depending on what you're eating when you get a diagnosis like psoriasis. And though not everyone diagnosed with psoriasis is consuming a processed food diet, another common issue is low fiber intake. While a processed diet would certainly limit fiber intake, those with IBS symptoms, especially if you're dealing with like looser stools and diarrhea, you might intentionally avoid fiber to help manage your gut symptoms. This is another reason why gut issues should be assessed in psoriasis cases since gut involvement is a well-established connection to this condition. When I say fiber, I am more specifically talking about FODMAP fibers, which are fermentable fibers found in certain foods. These fibers become food for the gut bacteria, your healthy gut bugs, to ferment and essentially convert into something called short chain fatty acids. Now, short chain fatty acids are crucial to support a healthy large intestine, especially because the major short chain fatty acid called butyrate helps to secure the junctions between colon cells. What this means is that it helps to keep the spaces between your gut cells very tight to avoid leakiness. You may have heard of something called leaky gut, and that's essentially what butyrate is helping to avoid. Additionally, research demonstrates that butyrate also may be able to help stabilize and regulate keratinocyte activity, which as you may already know, is helpful for those dealing with psoriasis, where keratinocytes tend to overproliferate, contributing to skin plaques. As for intake, my recommendation is to shoot for 35 grams of fiber daily. It's easy to do when fiber is spread out throughout the day and eaten with each meal. Healthy FODMAP foods include asparagus, avocado, berries, onions, garlic, cruciferous veggies, and legumes. I'm telling you, the list is lengthy. This is not complete. So go look up a list of FODMAP friendly foods and you will see what's on there. And you don't want to necessarily go for those low FODMAP foods. We want to incorporate in higher FODMAP foods because that's where the fiber is. However, If these FODMAP foods trigger IBS symptoms like gas and bloating, or maybe even gut discomfort or diarrhea, this is a sign of bacterial overgrowth within the GI tract. I'd recommend getting help from a nutrition professional who is skilled in identifying what's going on so you can eventually tolerate these healthy foods again. And you can absolutely tolerate them again. We work with clients in my practice on whatever is going on in terms of the dysfunction and gut dysbiosis to eventually reintroduce these foods successfully. Let's move on now to selenium, which is an important micronutrient that is most commonly associated with proper thyroid health, since it's a necessary cofactor for the conversion of inactive thyroid hormone, which is also called T4, to its active version, T3. Low levels seem to be found in those struggling with psoriasis and is also correlated to the severity of one's condition. So the worse your psoriasis symptoms are, the lower the selenium level is in your body. This has led researchers to conclude that the sufficiency of this mineral may have some protective effect in terms of psoriasis. Though I was unable to find research to connect two issues that I'm going to mention right now, I do feel that it's worth mentioning that those with psoriasis have an increased risk of developing Hashimoto's thyroiditis and other autoimmune versions of hypothyroidism. This is important because I've witnessed the havoc that having these two conditions together can wreak on clients. And I actually have one client whose story I've shared a couple of times, including her own recount of it, just to emphasize the importance of monitoring your thyroid health when you get a psoriasis diagnosis. So clinically, it didn't surprise me when I came across the research that mentioned the association found between insufficient selenium and psoriasis, because as you remember at the beginning, I said, selenium's important for this conversion. 
in our whole thyroid biochemical pathway to have this active version of thyroid hormone. So I don't know if there is any direct connection between the two, but again, just looking at them together and knowing that selenium seems to play a role in both, I think this is something that we should at least acknowledge and um, keep an eye on. Now, food sources of selenium include Brazil nuts, organ meats, meat and shellfish, The amount of selenium, by the way, found in Brazil nuts is rather astounding. You really only need to eat one or two of these nuts a day. Yes, you heard that correctly. One or two nuts a day to get a sizable dose of selenium. So please don't run out and just like eat a whole bag of Brazil nuts. That would be way overdoing it. One or two nuts a day is really all you need. And finally, we make our way down to protein. If you know anything about me, you know how much I believe protein intake is crucial for chronic skin issues, especially psoriasis. Research underscores that this important macronutrient is commonly low in the diet of those with psoriasis. And I can confirm that is a pretty common thing to see in my clinical practice. We often encourage clients to increase protein intake quite drastically, especially if we see other issues in their case, including poor thyroid function, gastrointestinal complaints, low digestive enzyme output from the pancreas specifically, and suboptimal or low secretory IgA production in the GI tract. And believe it or not, this is incredibly common with psoriasis. We see that trend a lot. There are certain general guidelines that you should know about protein. And one of them is that your body should not tap into muscle for its protein and amino acid needs. So that is really, really important. Please think about that. You should not ever tap into your muscle for protein needs. Doing so can cause muscle wasting and lead to other problems in your body. If you have previously thought that you've got plenty of muscle, so you don't need as much protein in your diet as maybe is being suggested to you, thinking that your muscle is a protein storage site, think again. So when protein needs aren't sufficient and you're not getting enough, especially in from your diet and maybe even not absorbing it appropriately, a lot of things can suffer, including body composition, as you can't increase muscle mass without an influx of amino acids. And this is obviously a red flag if you're losing weight. We also have issues with thyroid function because thyroid hormone is made with the amino acid tyrosine. And then we've got mood issues, and this is because amino acids help to form neurotransmitters like serotonin that support how your body experiences stress and anxiety. Then we've got liver detoxification challenges, specifically in phase two liver detox, which slow down, adding to the backup of toxins that require repackaging through your liver on these pathways. Then we've got digestion, where it becomes compromised because amino acids are used in your body to make digestive enzymes that break down your food. And by the way, all enzymes in your body that make any type of biochemical process go at a reasonable, efficient rate are all made from amino acids. And lastly, immune activity can become compromised since immunoglobulins in the gut, for example, like I mentioned those secretory IgAs, they help to protect you from unwanted organisms and endotoxins. When you simply don't have enough of a supply, your body can't make them. And just to take this one step further, in case you're thinking that like amino acids are all kind of the same thing, they're not. They are different from one another. So specific amino acids that are required to make these different things must be an ample supply. And when a specific amino acid level starts to drop, say it could be leucine or tyrosine, your body can't just substitute something else for it, assuming that whatever it's making will work the way it's supposed to. That means 
that if you're low in key protein building blocks, problems will ensue as your body seeks to prioritize other functions that are more life sustaining. So yes, protein intake is extremely crucial and often undervalued when it comes to chronic skin issues like psoriasis. And so if you're wondering how much you should consume, I would give you this basis. So protein intake at a minimum should be between 70 to 80 grams per day split between two to three different meals. You could also do some snacks in there that are protein dense. And if you are more active, say you exercise a lot, or you're looking to increase muscle mass, you will need an even higher protein intake than someone who is more sedentary. My final thoughts here on this whole topic, because I know this podcast ran rather long for a solo episode, is that nutrient deficiencies are not always apparent and are commonly blown off by conventional doctors because they don't believe that people can become deficient, as well as having a lack of training to understand what constitutes an insufficiency. Since doctors receive maybe a day or two of nutrition training in their entire time in medical school. So to say that doctors are vastly uneducated in assessing nutrient needs is an unfortunate truth at this point in time. And I say this not to knock doctors down, but instead to share a reality that can actually undermine your best efforts. Even my dad, who was a surgeon, admitted to me that he had no experience assessing labs and clinical presentations as I did for nutrient issues and nutritional biochemistry. I frequently see very insufficient levels of nutrients that aren't even necessarily low yet, or that the wrong labs got run, leading the doctor to assume that the nutrient status is fine when the lab they chose shows a transitory nutrient status that shifts with intake and what you ate on any given day at any given meal, rather than a marker that looks at actual nutrient stores. So that's why working with a nutrition professional can be really helpful because what's perceived as quote unquote normal on your labs might not be anywhere near what's optimal. Since we're talking about labs, I mentioned earlier in the episode that labs can be incredibly helpful in determining the intake of nutrients beyond a review of your diet. And we do both of these things in my practice, a dietary review as well as looking at labs. So I've got some resources for you in this episode's show notes on how you can get and ask for blood labs as well as functional stool testing that will be helpful for you on this journey. And if, by the way, you are looking for help on this, we are happy to help since my practice does work with clients virtually all over the world. So I hope this episode piques your interest in looking beyond your diet for my listeners living with psoriasis. Diet is certainly a component, but true need and absorption of nutrition is a factor that you have no way of assessing just by diet alone. Given the stress that your system is under because of psoriasis, it underscores why identifying nutrient deficiencies as one of those hidden 16 root causes I discuss is so important. If you're wondering how you can get started with that, my Skin Rash Root Cause Finder Guide actually has an entire assessment on nutrient deficiencies. So you can at least get an idea of what's going on in this area as well as other potential issues lurking under the surface. Now, if you've got any questions or thoughts you'd love to share on this, or you want to see the research I've put together for you, as well as all the various downloads, including my Skin Rash Root Cause Finder Guide to start digging into your unique root cause combo, head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 259 so we can keep the conversation going. And if this podcast episode has resonated with you and you believe that diet and nutrient status is important in terms of those dealing with psoriasis and even psoriatic arthritis, please share this episode with someone you know or within maybe a Facebook group or some sort of forum to encourage others with psoriasis to look deeper into these particular issues. Before you head off for your day, take a moment to rate and review the Healthy Skin Show on whatever podcast platform you use, and then hit the subscribe button so you can tune in each week 
for new research, tips, strategies, and inspiration to help you on your journey to rebuild healthy skin. Then let's connect. I'm at Jennifer Fugo over on Instagram. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.